Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting Authors at Google talk. Um, today we have the particular pleasure to host Dr. Ron Howard and Clint Corver. Um, they both work on the uh, Strategic Decisions Group, which is an organization dedicated to improving decision making um, in our society as a whole. Um, Professor Howard teaches Management Science and Engineering at Stanford, where he directs the Decisions and Ethics Center. He is also, as some of you may know, I see some former students in the class, which is, which is awesome, myself included. Um, he is the founder of the field of decision analysis. And so he has really you know, tra transformed and revolutionized that study into, you know, from, from the academic pursuit to the strength that it is in, in today's industry. Um, he applied his so Socratic philosophy, of course, not only to his work in industry, but most rewardingly to his work in the classroom. Um, he has received the Frank P. Ramsey Medal for Distinguished Contributions to, to Decision Analysis. And on a more personal note, as I mentioned, I had the, the privilege of taking both his Decision Analysis class and his Ethical Analyst class, about which this, this book is based. It was really one of the, the capstone pro uh, classes of my, my graduate education. So from the Decision anal Analysis party problem to changing my perspective on, on ethics through his class, um, I, my, these, these experiences were really the ones that I keep looking back to in my, my time at Google. Um, I didn't have a chance to see his thoughts on, on voluntary social systems, which is actually the third class he teaches, applying decision analysis to, uh, to society, but perhaps there'll be time for another book. Uh, Clint is actually a serial entrepreneur. He, is, he has built two consulting companies and is a visiting professor at, Gr at Grinnell College. Among other things, he runs Decision Street, which is a company that provides internet tools to facilitate the de decision-making process for people's everyday lives. And I, of course, remember the, the um, copious notes that he took in, in writing this book and during our classes. Um, today, they are both speaking to us about their most recent book, which is entitled Ethics for the Real World. Um, I, as, I, I witnessed this early generation like, through taking the ethical analyst class, and I'm quite pleased to now see it in print. Um, it, it distills the philosophy on ethical decision-making um, and taking us from the high-level, life-or-death Gedanken experiments to the more routine aspects of our daily lives. Um, after all, ethics is about not only the big decisions, but the, the way we interact on a, on a daily basis as well. One's ethical sh code shows itself in the details. This book details some of these, uh, these examples using anonymized uh, ethical codes in part. Um, as, as I read the book, there are, there are some that look very familiar. But I, I won't get into that right now. Uh, Professor Howard's ethics class is also built on the Socratic method. And true to Google tradition, we will have time at the end of our talk for some brief questions and answers. We have a microphone for the benefit of our YouTube audience. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Howard and, and Clint Corver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that great introduction, really. Oops, I'm glad that wasn't open. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that great introduction. It's always a pleasure to talk to people about this subject. Uh, Clint and I were discussing how we would organize today, and he suggested that I might want to start with how I got particularly interested in this subject. Uh, and that's a pretty simple story. Many, uh, for, as uh, <clears throat> we were just uh, hearing, uh, I've been in decision analysis for a very long time. We've worked in all kinds of problems uh, for businesses and for uh, medical uh, decisions and so forth. Uh, and then one day it came to pass that uh, a company came to us and said, uh, uh, we'd like to do a decision analysis of a, uh, <clears throat> of a project. Actually, it was, I think, a new fighter plane that uh, we're bidding on. And uh, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, we, we're sure that your analysis will show that this is the right plane. And, and that was kind of a turning point for me because when we were starting out with this field, it wasn't clear that it was going to have the kind of impact that it has had in certain kinds of uh, areas, particularly medicine and business. But this was a, a case where it was already being used and, and, in fact, it might now be misused because those of us who've studied the subject know that by, uh, by the kinds of alternatives you're willing to consider, the kinds of information you put in, the preferences that you add. You can make a decision analysis come out any way you want. So saying that you've done a decision analysis is no, no greater assurance of quality than saying, I used an adding machine. And that, the, the fact that this was now coming up as an issue that, that uh, people might be misusing it, 
uh, made me concerned about, well, how, if, if we have this powerful tool, just like uh, uh, my, my analogy is if I were making a, a rifle that I thought was going to be used in the Olympics uh, for the biathlon and so forth, and suddenly found that it was being the, the used to, to assassinate people, it was really great for that purpose, what would my responsibility be? Well, I'd want to be very careful about the training of people who got that rifle and so forth so it would not be misused. So that's when I started this course in, in ethics. Uh, well, gee, it's over 30 years ago. Maybe uh, we'll soon be getting on to 40. And <clears throat> in the course of, of that, it's been developed over many years. Sometimes we had very few students, but now it, it tends to be full even before the book came out uh, because there seems to be an increasing interest in ethics uh, in the world. And Clint, who uh, was a doctoral student in decision analysis, how many years ago now, Clint? 15. 15 years ago, okay, and has been following this interest in ethics. And more recently, as you've heard, he was attending the class. He'll, he'll actually be teaching it in the spring uh, when I'll be away. <clears throat> so he's, he, he has developed a corresponding interest, and it became clear that we ought to write a book on this subject uh, just a few years ago, and now you're holding it in your hand. So there's some, there's some, I think, special uh, lessons that we've gotten out of our considerations of ethics because we come from essentially an engineering point of view, and that's a, that's a little unusual for people who write books about ethics. Uh, books about ethics have been written for thousands of years in different forms, so it's not that you can go to the library and find a book on ethics. But what, what we wanted to do was, was uh, take a very much engineering practical approach and say, how can you make ethics a real choice that you make in your life? And in particular, something I, I would um, emphasize, how can you raise what we'll call your ethical sensitivity? How can you identify when a situation is ethical, uh, or ethically sensitive at least, uh, so that you ought to be giving it special consideration? And one of the things we do in this course to emphasize this, uh, and you, you heard a little bit about it, is have people develop a personal ethical code to, that they will use to guide their decisions in life. And we've emphasized that this is not a matter of uh, creating a code that looks good, so one that you'd be very proud of to see up on the wall, but one that you're really going to follow. No point in having high-sounding aspirations if you have no intention of actually living that way. So that's the challenge that people have when they go through uh, this course. Now, Clint, you, you have some recent thoughts on this subject, too, that I want to be sure we get a chance to talk about. Sure, just as a get the mic on. Hello? I'm going to get back here with this. i got a mic here. So just as a bit of context, so my, if you will, day job is as a serial entrepreneur and I've been doing angel investing for the last year. And one of the things that I noticed out there, if you will, in the business world is that most of the ethical dilemmas people face are not the ethical dilemmas discussed in most ethics classes. I mean, so Madoff and Enron and backdating stock options, they come up and they get all the attention, but that's not most people's day-to-day -day existence. Most people's day-to-day -day existence are do I tell the truth? Do I keep secrets? What does it mean to make a promise? And the challenge in that is a lot of people say, well, it's just a little thing. It's a little white lie. But it's in the day-to-day -day activities where your ethical habits are developed. And so as you go along, if the ethical habits you're developing are full of rationalizations and excuses, then when you run, then when you run into the big ones, now you're not prepared. And so part of the point behind this book is to help people become sensitive to the ethical situations that show up in everybody's daily lives and to learn some distinctions, to think clearly about those, ethical, those ethically sensitive situations so you're prepared to make the big decisions and, frankly, prepared to make the small decisions as well. And uh, so what we're going to do right here is uh, Professor Howard's going to walk through some basic ethical distinctions. So it'll give you some of the, there's, there's really only a handful from which you can analyze just about any ethical situation you run across. And then once we've got those, if you will, tools as, an, as part of our vocabulary, we'll spend the bulk of our time taking questions from the audience. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> what 
Some of these slides may not be appropriate, so I'll skip around. But one thing we want to emphasize is uh, it's pretty easy to judge the actions of others. And that's not what we're concerned about. It's not a matter of saying, well, that person did the wrong thing, or I wouldn't have done that. But rather raising our own ethical sensitivity to our own actions. So this isn't about a course in how to judge others, but, but rather how to be more sensitive yourself to these situations, the kind of everyday ones that, that Clint mentioned that, that can kind of sneak up on you and prepare yourself to carry that same spirit of doing what you know is the right thing throughout all the actions in your life. Now, in view of that, let me just go to a, uh, yeah, here's, here's uh, the, some of the distinctions that we find pretty useful. Uh, and uh, let's begin with what we're talking about, acts, that is things we do. So some people want to talk about the ethics of your thought and so forth, lusting in the mind and so forth. That's fine. But we're concerned about what you actually do, which affects you and other people. And we, we have three different dimensions that we're going to uh, apply to any act. The first one's a pretty simple one, and I use the word prudential to describe that. Prudential means, is it in your self-interest? Short run, long run, whatever. But is it in your self-interest? Now, many times, that's a pretty easy thing. Somebody says, would it be OK to buy a stereo? OK, well, what's wrong with that? If you enjoy it, it costs money. You can make a decision about it. It's not, for most of us, a method, an ethically sensitive act to, to purchase something. Or how about should you brush your teeth every day? It's probably a good thing to do. It uh, helps with dental being healthy and uh, minimizing costs for dental care. It's all about prudential. So as far as I know, there's no ethical system that says, you know, you must brush your teeth every day or it's wrong to brush your teeth every day. So that's the prudential aspect. Now, the next dimension is legal, meaning is this, in this particular society, is this act either forbidden uh, by the law, which means that your body or your property will be affected if you, if you do it? Or is it something that you're required to do by the law, and if you don't do it, uh, then you will have the same kinds of penalties? So that's the legal dimension. Okay. Now, the, the third dimension, we'll come back to the legal one, <clears throat> is, uh, is it right? That's the ethical dimension. In your, in your view of right and wrong in the world, is this act a right act to perform? Now, sometimes there's conflicts between the legal and the ethical. And the, perhaps the most famous one <laughs> would be in the uh, trial of the uh, Nazi leaders following World War II, the Nuremberg trials. Because their claim, uh, and I think the claim could not be refuted, uh, was that everything they did was completely legal under German law. I mean, Hitler was elected by 95% of the German people democratically. Uh, the, uh, the Nazis were very methodical in having laws passed that justified everything they did. If you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, you can see a list of all these laws and their consequences. Uh, but their, so their, their defense when they were accused of, of a crime was, hey, this is strictly legal. We're just following orders. And what the Nuremberg trials said was that there's a higher standard, that just doing something legal uh, acts that you think are legal within your system may not be right. And that's essentially what many of them were convicted of. So this distinction between legal and ethical exists uh, in the world now, but it also should exist in, uh, in each of us. And we can choose uh, which we do. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> uh, several years ago, may still be true, there were uh, people in the southern uh, U.S. near the Mexican border, who particularly belonged to religious communities, who said uh, that th it was wrong <coughs> for uh, the U.S. to uh, uh, prevent refugees from some of the troubles further south in Central, Central America from entering and staying in the U.S. Now, it was against the law to harbor any of these, we would, they would be called illegal immigrants, 
and there would be penalties for doing that. So it, some of these people <clears throat> in these religious communities and churches decided to do it because they said it was the right thing to do. So for them, it was illegal, but it was ethical. Now what about prudential? Well, you can imagine in those same communities, some people might say, well, I know it's the right thing to do, but because it's illegal and there are penalties, it's not prudential for me. I have to feed my family and so forth. If I get arrested and put in jail, uh, I, I just can't take that risk. Whereas other people would say it's prudential for us. I, we can handle that, so it'll be not only the right thing to do, but prudential, even though it is illegal at that time. So the, these three dimensions exist for just about every act. And just thinking about the three of them uh, can sort us, help us sort out uh, what is the right thing to do in any situation. Okay. Now the other aspect of distinctions that we'll have here are the difference between a positive and a negative ethics. A positive ethic is, is one that requires you to expend some energy. So you have to do something. A negative one uh, is that you're going to refrain from doing something which takes no energy at all. So if I have the ethic of not uh, murdering innocent people, uh, I, gee, I, I didn't murder anybody yesterday or the day before. I'm not planning to do it. It takes no energy at all. Don't even work up a sweat not murdering innocent people. But if I have an ethic saying, I'm going to feed the hungry, well, that could take all of my time and energy. <laughs> look at Google, look at all the energy they put into feeding the hungry, right? So whenever you say, I'm gonna do something that requires energy and your time, you have to be judicious in having a positive ethic because uh, it looks good, but if you're really gonna do it, you can't, you're, you're limited in your abilities. Whereas negative ethics are easy to accept because they require no energy. So when we look at the lists of, of ethical rules, one might be not murdering people, another might be not stealing, another might be not lying, they don't take energy. But if you put the positive side on it, I'm going to return property to people that's been stolen. Well, you could, you could spend your whole life just returning stolen bicycles at Stanford University back to their owners. Okay, so that's the difference between a positive and a negative ethic. Most ethical rules <coughs> are lists that are of negative ethics. Okay, and that negative doesn't mean bad, it's just the question of whether energy is required or not. Negative ethics don't require energy, positive ones do. Any questions as long as we're here on, on these distinctions because they're kind of critical to, to our further uh, discussion. Speaking of yeah. Should we judge ourselves based on positive ethics as opposed to negative ethics? Because negative ethics are easy to follow. Speaking? Well, they're not so easy to follow as you might think. They just don't take energy. For example, and this is one that Clint mentioned, uh, how about uh, I'm not going to lie? Okay? So if, if you're somebody's assistant, this wouldn't happen at Google. And the, the boss says, uh, uh, when a phone call comes in, tell him I'm out. Now that, that doesn't sound like a terrible thing. It's a lie. You're saying something that you know not to be true with the intention of misleading someone. So that we define a lie pretty carefully. A lie isn't being mistaken. See, if you ask me if my car is in the Google parking lot, I'd say yes, but of course it might have been stolen. <laughs> but if it was stolen, I wouldn't say I lied, I'd say I was mistaken and it wasn't there. Okay? But even the, the, these look like minor lies, like yeah, he's busy when he's not busy, those are all lies. So if you have an ethic of telling the truth, then you find out a lot of what goes on in everyday discourse doesn't meet that test. And in fact, we have lots of discussion in classes, uh, Clint can testify about white lies. Okay, you know, particularly somebody says, yeah, how would you like to go out on a date with me? I'm, I'm washing my hair. Okay, well, often those statements, which are kind of accepted as, as code state, are just not true. So we're talking about a very high standard of just not saying anything that is certainly not false, but 
In addition, and this is the critical thing in the area of lying, and Clint was exactly right, most of the people here at Google, most of us uh, in our society, aren't strongly tempted to go out and murder innocent people or steal. We have better alternatives, right? So, so adopting those as, as ethics is pretty simple for people in this situation. But the truth telling is a much tougher one because you will be surrounded in any organization with effort, with, with uh, uh, people who have adopted a different standard for their speech and don't even know it. And we'll even have justifications for why lies called white lies are good. You don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. And you've all encountered this in your everyday lives. Now, do I look fat in this dress? OK? You've all been there. And, and the question is not what, what you say, but t figuring out what the real truth is and saying that. That's the hard work. And it's the most common. Clint, do you have anything you want to say on this subject? No. OK. Well, actually, not. we should repeat the questions for the uh, That's a very good idea. Video audience. Yeah. OK. We'll do that from now on. Sure. Uh, so in, in terms of the three parameters of what yeah. you think about in an act, the one that says legal is kind of like flashing before me, even though it isn't really in the Oh, yeah. And, I, and I, I'm guessing that you're going to get into this, but mm -hmm. does, does that one trump ethics, or does it trump whether something Oh, sorry. Is, thank you. Right. Uh, I, I won't start. Yeah, yeah. But, or does it, does it trump, uh, does legal trump prudential or ethical in your view? Not to me. I'm sorry, the question, but I, I'm sorry, did, did that get required? The question was, does le in my view, does legal trump uh, prudential or ethical? And for me, it doesn't. Okay, and, I, and the, the, uh, there are so many things that, well, for, for example, you've opened up a, a very big subject here. There's a lot of laws that you might personally disagree with. You might even think they're wrong. Now, do you want to follow those laws? Well, that's a prudential issue. Okay? Unless you have the ethic, or the, the, you have as your, as your uh, rule here, that you will always follow the law. Okay? No matter what, no matter how silly it is, no matter if it requires you to do things that you don't want to do, you'll do it. Now, this comes up at the Stanford where we have an, uh, an honor code. And everybody who gets into Stanford has to sign the honor code. There's no question about it. And it has two aspects to it. One is that you will not, uh, you will not uh, uh, take help that is not, not defined as OK by the professor and so forth. In other words, you're going to live up to, you won't take, take advantage of uh, other sources than the ones permitted to do your work. But it also says that you will enforce this code yourself. In other words, if you see somebody else cheating, it's up to you. This is a completely student-run thing. They're supposed to be willing to turn in people that they think are cheating. Well, guess what? When we get into this in, the, in class, a lot more will say, well, I wouldn't do it. But practically no one will say, yeah, but I'd turn them in. You know, I'd, I'd shun them, but they won't take the other side to it. But that's the law. So in every, in every situation, you have to look and see, is that a law that you personally uh, applaud and would enforce. That's my rule. Uh, is it the right thing to do or is it not? For example, in our society right now, there are certain substances, if you put them in your mouth, uh, it's against the law. Notice it's not against the law to drink a can of drain cleaner, which will probably kill you, you know, lie. There's no law against that. But if you put certain herbs in your mouth, okay, certain weeds from around the world, that's against the law. And you can have very serious penalties for doing that. As a matter of fact, if you look in the law in the United States, there's some very disparate penalties between cocaine and, and crack cocaine. And these fall very disparately on different people in the population, very long sentences. So the question is, if, if that's the law and you're, you're on a jury, and you're ready to, <clears throat> judge says, well, did, did this guy put this stuff in his mouth or not, or sell it? Technically, <clears throat> you're advised in any court in California that juries are supposed to 
be triers of fact. In other words, the only question is, did the person do it or not? You're not supposed to be concerned with whether the law is a just law or even what the penalty will be. Okay? Well, there's another principle called jury nullification, which goes back to the time of the Magna Carta. You remember that the idea of juries in the Magna Carta was the, the nobles <coughs> were tired of the king taking their land. So they said, well, the, there, there has to be a law about this. And, and if we're accused, if, if the king does something like that and, and says it's OK, we want a jury of our peers to determine whether it's OK or not. Well, if the king is making the law, and the juries are just triers of fact, the, the king can make the law like, if you can't jump 20 feet in the air, I get your land. And then the jury says, OK, you know, see if he can jump, he can't, so there goes the land. So for that system to work, the jury should, had to be able to, and traditionally was able to, acquit for any reason, including an unjust law. OK, that's jury nullification. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm a believer in jury nullification. So I wouldn't send a person to jail if I run a jury <coughs> for a law that I considered unjust. And just to jump in here, Ron. Yes, I mean, please. So, so, so this is not a tangent, by the way. This is the core of a lot of the components of the book. I mean, so you've got basically two out of the three key distinctions that are in the book right here. And this notion of you know, the legal versus ethical comes up in historical contexts as well. So Gandhi, for example. And so Gandhi, in his civil disobedience, was doing something he believed was ethical, even though it was illegal. And there are numerous other examples like that. And I got to imagine, as Google, when you're going into many different countries around the world, you're encountering quite a variety of laws. I mean, matter of fact, we have an example in the book of Google going into China and showing how these three dimensions all come into play in terms of following the laws of China, which China says you have to do that if you want your servers on our, our foreign property. But then you've got an ethic internal, internally here of you know, open information. And you know, so this notion of censorship kind of goes against that. And there's prudential issues. Right? What about Baidu and how are we going to compete against them? And so it's, a, it's an incredibly confusing, convoluted situation. And one of our arguments is if you sort the pieces out, so here's the prudential issues with respect to competing with Baidu. Here are the issues with respect to the laws. And here are the, here's our ethics. If you sort them out, often the ethical component in particular becomes much, much simpler. Ethics often get unneededly, unduly complicated when you layer in prudential and legal issues. And so we find in our, like in the class at Stanford, people struggle with issues for years, and just this distinction alone, all of a sudden it becomes clear to them what their right answer is. So, so it may seem simple on the surface, but in terms of your own situations, if you can pull off the legal and the prudential, so you find out what's left at the ethical at the end of the day, you're well served by doing so. Well said. Any, any other questions from the audience? Please. Is there, a, excuse me, is there a distinction between ethics and morals, or are the terms used inter interchangeably? Well, I, the question is, is there a distinction between ethics and morals? <clears throat> I think it's useful to think about morals more as the, the habits and traditions of a culture and ethics about eternal standards of right and wrong. Okay, so, so, so how, let's say, how, how, you, how revealingly you dress might be a moral issue in some society, okay? But not a right or wrong issue. Another way to think about this, as you move from culture to culture, the morals and mores may change, but your individual ethics may not. So ethics are tied to you as an individual as opposed to the society or the culture. That's not to say that it's always easy once no, you've made these distinctions. For example, in the class, people will say, of course, we have people from all over the world, literally in the class, and they say, well, you know, in my country, if you're stopped by a traffic policeman, uh, you have a choice, right? You can give him a small payment uh, and not have a lot of trouble, or you, which, which is the, the, the uh, illegal thing to do if you look at technically what's so in that society, or you can do the illegal, do that illegal thing, 
uh, and uh, not have a lot of trouble for a small amount of money. Now, in California, that tends to not be a problem. I'm not even, I would never be tempted to, to slip money to a highway patrol officer hoping that, that he's going to look the other way. But that's, that's just the way it is in, in, in this particular location. Around the world, it may not be that way. So then it becomes a prudential matter for you, whether you're going to do something that's illegal in that society, but quite common. And this is even a bigger scale when you get into countries where, with business practices where you're expected to, well, it's interesting. I had a, <clears throat> a student come by the other day, former student, a uh, doctoral student who's out in an other country, I won't mention which one. But this country is in the process of nationalizing some of its businesses. And the student and his family own a business. And the government representatives came and said, okay, we're gonna take over your business. Uh, and you know, we can sort of give you whatever we want for it, like a, not very much. Or, and this is only a couple of weeks ago, he said, or the, the government represents said, well, you can do this. You can write down what you think is a fair price for your business. And, you know, you know what it's worth, so, so write it down. And what we'll do is we'll pay you 80% of that to you. But what we're going to do is add uh, another 30%. So if it was a, you know, 100 units, uh, he wrote down 80 would be what they'd pay him. But then he has to add in another 30 to the official amount that they're going to pay him. And that additional 30, he has to deposit in 12 different secret bank accounts of people who work for the government. I mean, this is not a, this is not a made up story, right? And he said, now what can we do, right? I mean, my father who started this business, uh, you know, he, he'll have nothing if, if we, just walk, I mean, they'll give him, you know, five instead of anything like those numbers we're talking about. So his whole life will have seemed that he couldn't live, he couldn't leave a patrimony is the word he used for his children. Or, uh, as my student said, you know, well, I don't want to be party to this because this, this money is not coming from, from uh, other than the, the, the people of the country. In other words, it's the country's money that's being spent for the business, maybe 80 of that uh, is, a re is, a, is a bargain price for them in buying this business, but the other 30 is just enriching federal officials. And it was very intricate. It wasn't the, the bank account wasn't the account of these officials, it was their nephew, uh, their, their uncle. In other words, it was on the, on the surface of it, uh, it would take some investigation to figure out what actually happened to that extra 30 units that was going. And he said, what should I do? So these are not only hypothetical questions that we face. They're very practical ones. And he has these distinctions, and he can, he can understand them and decide what to do. So there's a characteristic here of ethical challenges is they tend to come up pretty quickly when they come up, right? When you have the meeting with a government representative. Or if you're going into a meeting with a customer, and your boss pulls you aside and says, we can't deliver as promised, but we want you to tell him this story instead. And so I mean, it's not like you've got time to sit there and think about your ethics and weigh the pros and the cons and the prudential issues, prudential issues and so forth. Usually you're on the spot. And the trouble with being on the spot, if you haven't thought through your ethics beforehand, you're likely to come up with a rationalization or fall into some sort of thinking trap that later you might regret. So one of the core messages in the class and in the book is simply think ahead before you run into these situations, think about your ethics. So it's not so much a matter that we have a particular belief about what your ethics should be, but if you think carefully about your ethics now, then when you're confronted with these, with these surprising situations, you've got something to fall back on. Uh, in, in the first day of the class, the thing that we do, maybe the first couple of days, is just go around the room and have people talk about a personal uh, experience they had, either, either in their, their lives or in their professional lives, that was ethically sensitive. 
Then we just keep going around. And we find a whole variety of things, but there's no one uh, who can't think of one. There's always something in their lives. From, one was a, <clears throat> a woman who was from uh, a, a, a foreign country where the government had a lot of control and some people in the town where she lived were very much in the government uh, system. And uh, what she said was that her, her best friend <clears throat> had been raped by one of the people who was close to the government in this town. And, uh, but the, the, the friend didn't feel comfortable in letting it be known, first of all, she'd get in this particular society, a lot of shame and so forth for doing that. And she knew that, that really no, no uh, a consequence would come in terms of punishment to that person. So <clears throat> this was her ethical dilemma, and she decided not to say anything about it, although she thought that was the wrong thing to do. Well, about six years later, <clears throat> she came to visit me, and uh, she was, uh, you know, work in the U.S., and I, I said, whatever happened with your friend and all that? And she said, no, that wasn't my friend, that was me. So these things happen to everybody. And, and, and going around that room, we got a lot of cases where people worked in a company, and they were told to do things like the one Clint mentioned, you know, we're trying to uh, do this contract for a client. It's not working out. The client's coming to visit. Uh, don't tell them that the test isn't working well. Just have confidence. We'll pull it all together. And uh, the, the student's saying, yeah, but we, that's not true. Okay? But you're telling me to say that. And th these, these uh, situations where, where people are working in a, in a company where they're asked to do things they consider unethical really wear on them. As a matter of fact, one of the things we talk about later in the class and in the book is one of the big decisions you make <clears throat> is, is the organizations you join and to see whether their ethical code is consistent with yours. Because if it isn't, sooner or later, there's going to be a, a massive problem for you, no matter how attractive the pay is or what the uh, opportunities for advancement are, sooner or later. Or as we sometimes joke, don't, don't take a job as an executioner if you don't want to kill people, no matter how high the pay is, because sooner or later you're going to have to do it. And uh, <clears throat> you won't like it. Okay. Well, there's a few other things, I think, in our pack here. <coughs> yeah, there's two major, some, you can see here, we sometimes we go through the Ten Commandments. You can do that at your leisure to see which ones are, are uh, <coughs> ethically sensitive. But you can do that on your own time. Usually takes about about uh, 10 minutes for people to remember what the Ten Commandments are. And then we go through the, the, uh, the rules of Islam and Buddhism and so forth. But there are two major ethical theories out there that have been developed over the, the years. Uh, and for simplicity, uh, I call them action-based versus consequence-based. The first says you should judge an action uh, by whether that action itself is right or wrong. The consequence based one says, don't judge acts uh, by what you do, but on the consequences of those acts. And these are very different ethical bases. So suppose somebody comes up to me and says, <clears throat> what do I have to pay you to murder Clint, an innocent person? Okay, well, <clears throat> If I'm action-based, I say, I just don't murder innocent people. That's the end of it, the end of the discussion. If I'm consequence-based, I say, well, I, I wouldn't like to do that. But what are the consequences of doing it? I say, oh, well, Clint has a substance in his liver that once we kill him and take that liver, we can cure 10,000 people who've got cancer. 10,000? Yeah. I don't, know. I don't know, but he's a nice guy, though. Well, wait a second, you're not going to get caught. Oh, so, so I, can, I can kill him, 
there'll be no consequences to me, and I'm going to have 10,000 people cured of cancer, right? No, I, uh, I still don't want it. They said, yeah, but we're going to get rid of flat tires, mosquitoes, right? <laughs> bad movies. Now, take a list of all the things you'd love to get rid of in the world on one side of the scale, and here's poor Clint on the other side. See? If I'm consequence-based, sooner or later, that scale is getting very heavy. But if I'm action-based, I don't even have a scale. So you can think about whether you want an have an action-based ethical system. This is a very fundamental. It's probably the most fundamental choice in your ethical code. Are you going to judge your, your acts, your ethical acts, by, by the act themselves or by what follows from it? So take about take telling the truth. You see, if you have a, an action-based, I tell the truth. I don't care what happens, right? That's very different from saying, well, what comes out of my mouth depends on what the consequences for everybody are. And you can quickly see how there are dilemmas that people have. Okay, you, you have a friend who <coughs> works for the company and who really screwed up and somebody comes in, so who screwed that up? And you know. And they say, well, do you know? Now, now, now's the first time. To, do you lie? Oh, I have no idea, right? Or do you say, I know and I won't say, which may have consequences for you? So these, are, these, these tests are easy to define, but hard to meet sometimes. You only have to think about those consequences, if, if you're consequence-based. Of course, if you just, it's so simple, I think Clint and I agree on that. It's so simple to just tell the truth all the time. But it's shocking to people. They're not used to hearing the truth. Now, the real question, and I've said this before, but I want to emphasize it. The, real, the problem is knowing what the real truth is. So we have a little example in the book and we talk about in class where <clears throat> suppose uh, there's a couple of students and they've just gotten to know each other. And uh, a couple of guys, let's say, and uh, one says, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, of uh, going to the movies tonight. Would you like to come? And the other one, what the other one wants to do is just uh, watch, hang back and watch TV and, and uh, you know, lays in the room. But he might be tempted to say, well, I've got a lot of homework to do. Okay? Now, that's always true for a student, right? So he, has, he hasn't told a lie, but, but he's making it sound like that's the reason he doesn't want to go to the movies. So now, let's think about what happens the next day if he does that. Well, if he's made this story up about the homework and made that his case, then the next morning when they meet each other, <coughs> the, the other guy went to Moomites, well, well did, it, did you get all the homework done that you planned to? Hmm, time for another misrepresentation. How about this? Not as much as I'd hoped to. Okay? So he hasn't really told an actual lie yet, right? But think about what's happening to the relationship here in this discussion. It's going nowhere. Now, suppose he had really looked into his mind the night before and found out what the real truth is. Well, the real truth is, is you know, he sort of liked to go to the movies with this guy, but he'd much prefer to lie back in his room and not do anything tonight. Then he might say, you know, thank you for the invitation. Uh, you know, I really just want to Lay, ba lay back and goof off tonight in my room. But, you know, some other time I really would like to go to the movies with you. I don't want you to take this. I'm afraid you might take that as I don't want to ever do that, but that's not true, if it is not true. And so now what happens the next morning? Next morning, he can say, well, how was the movie? Oh, the movie was great. Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah. And what I found is every time that you tell the real truth, which you have to search for, you've deepened the relationship between the people instead of separating it. And that's one of the big pluses that comes from telling the truth. Please. And but don't, but for in real life, don't you need to have some sort of a hierarchy within your ethics, within your action-based ethics, and have some sort of consequences? For instance, if the Nazis come to your door looking for the Jews, as it has really happened in various cases, and you need to tell a lie because you know that they're going to be murdered otherwise. So in some senses, you're combining the two. You're, you're, 
under normal circumstances you would tell the truth, but if the if the if the if that would lead to an action that's higher on the hierarchy being violated, you'd have to um, go to the consequences. Well, just think about that. You know, it, one of the things that I like to think about is who would my, my moral teacher, my ethical teachers be? In other words, if you asked Christ this or if you asked Buddha this, whoever you want to take as a, someone you'd say is, is admirable for their ethics, what would, what would they do if the Nazi asked them? You're pretty sure they transcend the situation somehow. Okay? Now, there's a number of, somebody, I think it was uh, one of the people who advised the concentration camp said, is your ultimate freedom is your choice of how you respond to any situation. In other words, when the Nazis come to take you to the concentration camp, you have a whole variety of alternatives, right? You can cry and beg, you can you know, lick their boots, you can spit in their face. And there'll be all kinds of consequences to that, right? But that's really your choice. So, so when they ask you where the Jews are, you, could, you can say, I, I am not going to tell you where they are, even if I knew. Ah. Now, those, the consequence for you might be different from if you, see, you say, well, it would be easy just to say, uh, 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 there's someplace else, but when they check there and then they come back, what happens to you? But no one can make you hurt someone else. You would only do that out of fear for yourself. Just to add a, a little bit to here. We're not saying tell the truth is easy. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, there's a great deal of skill that comes into play in telling the truth in a way that's helpful in a situation. So I mean, so, I mean this is a fairly extreme, but think of another one that's more common, which is life and death situations. So someone's in the hospital, they're not doing well, and basically they don't have long to live. So a common challenge that families deal with, and even nurses and doctors, is how much do you tell the patient? If you tell the patient they only have two weeks to live, is that going to destroy their hope and, in fact, worsen their situation? And, in fact, a lot of nurses who get into this, this they think this very thing when they first get into the profession. If you talk to nurses that have been in there you know, many years, their notion is, of course you tell the patient. I mean. It, it would be a crime not to, because by telling the patient, what you find is they have an opportunity to set things right with their families, and, and you give them essentially the power of choice. And any time you don't, essentially you are treating them like a child. You're saying you do not have the, we're not, and, and so I guess you know, at the end of the day, the question becomes what kind of relationship do you want to have with people? And what kind of story do you want to be able to tell about yourself? And so we talk about, actually, in the, in the book, we talk quite a bit about at the end. So there's a part of ethics which is just don't do the wrong thing. So like not lying. So a not, not lying situation would be you know, something like what Professor Howard said, which is I'm not going to tell you where the, um, the folks are even if I knew. But if you can get to that next level where you can say, this is an opportunity for you to deepen the relationship, for you to get to a next level. And in that particular circumstance, it would take someone very skilled to do it. But in the situation where somebody says, do you think I look fat in this dress? Which is more the daily one. Now this is, I mean, this is well within sort of the, the opportunity, certainly the folks in this room, to transcend that and deepen the relationship. Just to give you some, some sort of statistics along kind of the do I look fat in the dress line? So when people do studies of like people's lying and have logs and so forth, on average students lie twice a day. And folks that are in the working world and in the community lie once a day. It, you ask them, if you ask people, have you ever cheated on a test? 70% of students admit to treating, cheating on tests. Then you've got 50% of people, 50% of all resumes contain a lie. 50% of all people admit to stealing office supplies. So from my point of view, this is where the action is, in the sense that these little daily sorts of activities are where you develop your ethical thinking habits. And these are what ultimately are you building your character you know, day by day, act by act. Quentin used the magic word character, which is, which is uh, something we don't hear about too much these days. But, this is really the, your character is built uh, 
on many things, but in particular on how you behave as an ethical person. Okay, I remember my father used to talk about someone being a man of his word. Okay, uh, I don't hear that too much anymore, not even a man or woman of his or her word. It's, it's, that, that, that says something about someone, to be a person whose word means something, and that comes partly from their ethical behavior. I saw a hand go up and down, please. Uh, first, I just want to make a comment on the do I look fat and you know, what should we say about it. And that seems to me like a special situation where your loved one or whoever that might be is you know, wanting you to say, tell me I don't look fat. So that doesn't you know, at least you know, look to me as much of a dilemma because it is not a real question as in you know, just you know, reinforce my beliefs about my body or whatever. And then you know, if you care about the person, Maybe you know there's not much of a you know choice there. So what are you saying? Now I would say no. You don't look, you don't look fat because to me that's not a real question that she's trying then, to get an answer. Then they on. say, do you mean that or are you just saying it? Okay, here's the thing. So See, what just I, remember, I, these are real people, right? Yeah. Uh, but um, to they me, they know when you're shining uh, me. But I think the underlying premise is that you know she's not asking you to give your honest judgment. She's wanting you to basically reinforce her opinion about her own body. And you know there are two different things. This is not like you know uh, a stealing you know, from office supplies where it, you know you need to character. And you know this is a you know real ethics situation. So how what could you say that would deepen your relationship? What could you say? Uh, I mean, you could say you know I've seen you better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but. <sighs> Not prudential, right? Now, uh, that, that's my second comment, actually, because it seems to me like, you know, there's not a strict line between being prudential and ethics because people usually be, be, you know, ethical because it makes them feel good in the long run to have a character and everything. So I'm not really sure, you know, they, they're necessarily, you know, conflicting because if you have a measurable, you know, short-term goal, like, which, which, for example, is Let's say you knew you steal ten thousand dollars from someone. Let, let's and, stick with the fat. But the fat is, I think, a, you know, much different issue than. What know. is it? See, the, the point is, what? How truthful a relationship do you want? See, my my assumption is that that is not the premise of that question. It is not. It is not, you know, that she is really wanting your honest opinion. It's just saying, you know, just enforce my beliefs. So you could, you could inquire, you say, do you really want me, do you, you care about whether I think you look fat or whether I love you just the way you are? Is that really what you're asking me? Yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. I could. <laughs> I would. But then, you know, that puts her in a spot where, you no, know, she See, has to drop her. She loves to her. be told. See, if you really love her, and that's another issue, right, or whether, what, your, what your relationship is really... You have no trouble saying that, and you mean it. No, but then you know she could be de defensive, saying that, "Hey, actually, I really meant it." Because uh, if she backs out, if she says, "You know, oh, actually, I wanted your affection," I, I don't think you know people would do it. You know, spontaneously. You keep saying you know, but I don't know. <laughs> sure, I. But but still, you know, even if you come out as saying, "Hey, do you really want want my honest opinion, or you know, I love you the way you are?" I don't, we I have think to see what the real question is. See, no one said that you have to answer the questions the way they're asked. Right? The, the, the object is to get to the real truth of your relationship, not to say something that'll pass it off. See, it's so easy. Here's a perfect example. You say, no, you look wonderful. Okay, now the whole, the, the opportunity to deepen your relationship has passed. Maybe you'll get some more. But you see, everybody knows that they're getting older and less attractive all the time. So you're suggesting, you know, <laughs> we, like politicians, do you divert the question to something else? No, not at all. Heaven for <laughs> heaven for Finn, right? No, because because you know they're really good at answering some other question, but right? But see, what what is the source? See, if they want to know whether this is red or orange, I mean, if it's a factual question, you just answer it. But you suspect in this question, there's more to it than that. And you pick that up yourself. Yeah. This is some kind of, of, of uh, support that they're looking for from you. Right? Yes. So yes. then the question, what's the real support they need? And if, if you have it, give it to them. But not by 
by some superficial thing about, you know, is this flattering for me or something like that. That is correct, but, you know, she's asking for a yes or no at that very moment. That's and what then, you said. And then, you know, if you dilly-dally. See, there's the question underneath the question, right? I think my qu question is, you know, if, if she says, hey, okay, you know, do I look fat? You're like, well, honey, you know, let's go, you know, deeper into, you know, what that means and that kind of stuff, even in a subtle way that doesn't answer her question right away. So unless you're uber skillful in terms of I think the ladies know what I'm talking about. Do they? Do you Look at <laughs> Okay. If only the camera up here, you see the ladies <laughs> nodding, nodding. <laughs> okay, I'm done, thank you. No, no, this is an opportunity for you, see? I mean, you can, if, if this ever happens to you, you say, you know, this came up in a, a, in a, a talk we had. You know, now you can even open the question, right? Yeah. Remember, the, there's a, isn't there a fairy tale that has a mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? It's supposed to say you are. You could buy that, right? Everybody could, oh, man, you're the most beautiful thing in the world, mirror, right? But who, who would really want one if you, if you knew that that's the way it operated? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I want to ask, to go back to your previous example. So people come to your house to search for someone <laughs> whom you gave refuge. And if you answer them in that straightforward way, I wouldn't uh, tell you even if I know, yeah. you are almost certainly inviting a search on your property. So that runs contrary to your objective to um, give this refuge to these people. Well, you see, the, the question that I brought up about the giving refuge wasn't whether they would tell the truth if agents came, mm -hmm. but whether they should even shelter them in the first place, right? Now, whenever we get one of these questions, I always, as I said before, think about what someone of the highest uh, ethical view would have. And I can't imagine them doing something simple like lying, mm -hmm. right? In other words, I can't imagine Buddha or Gandhi or Christ giving the simple answer. They would transcend the situation. There's a famous parable about the Buddha <coughs> who, uh, was visiting a small town, and they said, uh, don't go up on a mountain because there's a man up there who's killed a thousand people, murder of a thousand people, and he just assumed kill you is look at you. So Buddha said, well, I have to check this out, so naturally he goes up the mountain, and here comes the murder, really big, strong guy. He says, I'm gonna kill you. Buddha says, one request, please, four. Well, what is it, but you're, you're a dead man. And he's got this giant sword. And Buddha says, well, you see this tree here with his limb on it, big fat limb? Could, could you whack off that limb with one blow? Murder says, not a problem, a whack. Takes it right off. Buddha says, OK, now put it back on again. And the murderer became enlightened and a monk. So essentially, you That's you, the you power expect, of transformation. You expect a miracle to happen. Uh, I think these people were surrounded by miracles. Okay. So I, I, I hear this question and then I think one of the answers that I thought that I, I've heard to this type of problem is, uh, was out of a story from the Underground Railway uh, from people who were harboring slaves escaping. and that a search party came to this one house and they asked the man if he was harboring slaves. And he thought about it and his answer was, there, there are no slaves in my property. And it was, it was false from the point of view of the person who was asking the question. But from the point of view of the man who answered it, his firm belief was there was no such thing as a slave. And so in his mind, he was answering the truth and accomplishing right. his objectives. But you know, and, and these are interesting things to think about. But you could spend a whole ethical class on what we call these corner conditions. Because how often is a guy with a bloody ax going to say, where did that guy I was chasing go? And now you've got to figure out, do I lie to him or not? That's never happened to me, right? And you get into lifeboat ethics. You know, we have to throw somebody overboard. These are wonderful things to talk about in ethics classes. But remember our, our criterion. One of the things we face in life, the, you know, do I look fat in this dress is much more likely to come up. Or, or do we tell the client about the problems that we're having with this project? That happens very, very often. 
As a matter of fact, I had a student who took all the, all the classes, including this one, and he said that in his, and he worked major company, he said that in his inbox every day, the, the, the things that, that uh, came across his desk required more thought from the ethics class than from all the technical stuff that he was being paid for. So we're, we don't have to wait till the Nazis come to ask for the captives. We just have to look at our emails every day, listen to our phone conversation, the people we meet, and decide what kind of ethical character we're going to have for that day and the next day and the next day. So I, I think we have time for uh, one more question. All right, well, in, in that case, I'm Professor Howard. I'm Clint. It was a really enlightening talk. We really appreciate your coming to speak with us today. Thank you for having us.